We all love stories of the Wild West. It really is one of the most fascinating times in American history. But on this episode, we're going to be looking for some of the lesser known outlaws. Sure, we can make a video after video of Wyatt Earp or Jesse James, but let's take a look at five more outlaws you've never heard of. Welcome to Chronicles of Time, a channel that covers both well-known and obscure historical events. If you like what we're doing here, give us a like, a comment, and please subscribe. It really does help the channel. I hope everybody enjoys our upgraded audio. Please enjoy. Harry Tracy Harry Tracy was born in 1874 in Wisconsin and fell into a life of crime by rustling cattle. He killed Deputy Sheriff Arlie Grimes and two other men before hooking up with the famous outlaw Butch Cassidy and his gang, the Wild Bunch. In 1898, the gang killed a boy named William Strong during a robbery and was then heavily pursued by a posse. One of the posse, Valentine Hoy, was killed and Harry Tracy was arrested along with three other men. Harry Tracy escaped jail in Aspen, Colorado by almost killing a guard with a lead pipe. Harry Tracy made his way up to Portland, Oregon to continue his life of crime with a man named Dave Merrill. Both of these men were arrested in February of 1899 and Harry Tracy was sentenced to 20 years in the Salem, Oregon Penitentiary. In 1902, Harry Tracy and Dave Merrill escaped prison with the help of a female accomplice. Tracy and Merrill killed three men in their escape as well. Later that month, Harry Tracy killed his partner Dave Merrill for becoming weak in the state of Washington. Harry Tracy made his way up to the Seattle area and killed Detective Charles Raymond and Deputy John Williams on July 3rd. Harry Tracy was on the run again and was cornered in the ranch in Creston, Washington on August 6th. Harry Tracy killed two posse members and was then shot in the leg during the fight. With no way out of the gunfight, Harry Tracy turned the gun on himself and ended his own crime spree. The Seattle Times wrote about him on July 3rd of 1902 saying, quote, In all the criminal lore of the country, there is no record equal to that of Harry Tracy for cold-blooded nerve, desperation, and thirst for crime. Jesse James, compared with Tracy, is a Sunday school teacher. Nicholas Aragon Aragon is an outlaw that shows up on our Wild West radar with arguably the most famous outlaw of all time, Billy the Kid. Newspapers from the time called Aragon an old-time killer with over a dozen victims. Information about Aragon is pretty limited, but I did find a newspaper article that gives us a glimpse into the outlaw's life. This newspaper is from 1885, and I read, quote, Nicholas Aragon, the famous outlaw and murderer who was formerly a member of Billy the Kid's gang, was captured at the rendezvous near Chipolto, 30 miles out this morning. Deputy Sheriffs John Hurley and James Brent, both of Lincoln County, have been watching and following Aragon for some time, but until the middle or latter part of last week, they did not succeed in cornering their man. But at last, they traced him to the rendezvous and surrounded the premise, thereby cutting off his escape, at the same time keeping at a respectable distance to avoid being killed by the desperate man. Two Mexican women were in the adobe hut at the time, but upon awakening to the pending danger, Aragon advised them to surrender, which they did. They informed the officers that he was well armed and well supplied with ammunition and plenty to drink and eat and would never surrender. Deputy John Hurley of Fort Stanton mounted the roof of the hut and while he was digging a hole in which to deposit fire to smoke out the desperado, he was shot and killed instantly by the man within. The others of the posse succeeded in placing fire on the roof, but it was too wet to burn. In an unguarded moment, Aragon exposed himself at the small window and was pierced by a shot in the shoulder from Brent's rifle and injured slightly. 
Then Brent crowded up to the window cautiously, but as he raised himself to look at it, he was shot by Aragon, the bullet grazing his cheek. Brent then left a guard over the place and rode to Las Vegas for reinforcements and giant powder to explode under the building. Sheriff Romero of this city and a posse went back with Brent, and later that day, Aragon sent his guns out to Romero and surrendered. He was turned over to Brent, and unless he is lynched while en route, he will arrive in the morning and be placed in the Las Vegas jail. Robert Clay Allison Clay Allison was born in Tennessee and joined the Confederacy at the age of 20. He was discharged due to a head injury, but re-enlisted shortly after. Allison seemed to skirt the law a little bit in his time in the Wild West. He was famous for his incredibly violent temper. He would lead lynch mobs and vigilantes during his time as a rancher in Cimarron, New Mexico, and in the Panhandle of Texas. In 1870, a man named Charles Kennedy was being held in jail for the disappearance of a few strangers and Kennedy's old son. Clay Allison led a mob to the jail where they pulled Charles Kennedy out and hanged him. Kennedy's house was searched, and they found all the missing people deceased, including his own son. Clay Allison allegedly decapitated Charles Kennedy after he was hung and placed his head on a pole in front of the St. James Inn in the town of Cimarron, New Mexico. Clay Allison was also known for his incredibly fast draw speed. A man named Chunk Colbert found this out the hard way. In 1874, Colbert and Allison went to the Clifton House in Colfax County, New Mexico for dinner. The two had been in a quarrel over a physical altercation Clay Allison had with Colbert's uncle. During the meal, Colbert drew his pistol on Allison, but the barrel of his gun got stuck under the table. Allison drew his own revolver and shot Chunk Colbert one time. When Clay Allison was asked why he would accept a dinner invitation from a man who would try to kill him, Allison said, quote, Because I didn't want to send a man to hell on an empty stomach. In 1875, Clay Allison led a lynch mob to kill a man named Cruz Vega. Vega was accused of murdering Reverend F.J. Tolby, who was a Methodist circuit rider. Cruz Vega was caught by the lynch mob and hanged from a telephone pole in Cimarron, New Mexico. Members of Vega's family were enraged and went to confront Allison for his role in Cruz Vega's hanging. Vega's uncle, Francisco, tried to pull his revolver on Allison, but met the same fate as Chunk Colbert did. Clay Allison was faster and killed Francisco. Allison was charged but the charges were dropped because it was ruled as self-defense. Allison also ran into some trouble in Los Animas, Colorado, after a dispute over the right to carry weapons in the town's city limits. Constable Charles Faber busted into a local saloon with Allison and his brother John inside and opened fire. John Allison was shot three times and lived. Clay Allison fired four shots back at the lawman, and killed Constable Charles Faber. Both the Allison brothers were arrested, but again, charges were dropped because the constable initiated the gunfight. There are also stories of Clay Allison getting drunk in Texas and riding his horse naked through the town wearing only his holster and revolver. Allison died on July 1st, 1887, after he flipped a wagon full of supplies. He was buried the next day in Pecos Cemetery, but in 1975, he was moved to Pecos Park with arguably the coolest headstones I've ever seen. The first says, Robert C. Allison, gentleman, gunfighter. The other marker is at the foot of the grave and reads, quote, He never killed a man that did not need killing. Print Olive Born Isom Prentice Olive in Mississippi in 1840, he and his family made their way to Texas by covered wagon. He fought on the side of the Confederacy during the Civil War and started making his name as a rancher in 1866 with the assistance of his three brothers, 
Thomas, Ira, and Bob. Print quickly became one of the big cattle ranchers in the area. Although great fortunes could be made in the cattle industry after the Civil War, it could also be a pretty dangerous business. Print and his brothers were known to take the law into their own hands to protect their property. One notorious incident involved the murder of two suspected rustlers known as Turner and Crow. The men were killed by the death of the skins, an old Spanish method of torture. Wrapped alive in green cowhides, the men were left to die as the sun slowly caused the skin to contract. Since the skins used the olive brand, the murders were widely believed to be done by the olives. Despite an acquittal by the county court, many people continued to believe the brothers were guilty. The Olives lived fairly violent lives during their time in the Old West. Thomas Olive was killed in a gunfight. Bob shot a rancher named Cal Nutt, but was never convicted. The Olives decided to move to Nebraska in 1878 after a brief time in Colorado. They again found success ranching cattle, but their violent tendencies followed them. They found themselves in a fight with the neighboring ranchers, and Bob Olive was killed in a gunfight. When the neighboring ranch owner was found innocent, Print Olive led a lynch mob to hunt the two men down. They caught up with them and had them hanged and lit on fire. This gave Print Olive the name Manburner. Print was convicted of second-degree manslaughter charges, but the charges were dropped when the original witnesses failed to show up in court. Print Olive lost most of his fortune and legal fees in a downturn in the beef market. His family relocated to Colorado, and Print Olive was shot and killed by a man named Joe Sparrow in 1886 over a $3.50 gambling debt. Wild Bill Longley Born in Mill Creek, Texas, Longley got his criminal start early in life. After the Civil War was over, the Texas governor created a state police force made up of mostly freed slaves. One of these men was supposedly drunk and insulted Wild Bill's father and threatened him with a gun. Wild Bill told the man to lower his gun, and when the police officer started to aim at Wild Bill, Bill drew his gun and shot the man dead. Wild Bill went on to terrorize and kill two more black men in Lexington, Texas. In 1868, Wild Bill and two friends killed a former slave named Green Evans. Wild Bill would challenge many people to duel him and love to pick fights with anyone he deemed a Yankee sympathizer or a carpetbagger. Longley drifted around Texas with his brother-in-law, John Wilson, and began a crime spree. The pair robbed settlers and killed a freed slave named Paul Bryce in Bastrop, Texas, and a freed slave woman in Evergreen. Longley actually tried to go straight in 1870 and joined the U.S. Cavalry in Wyoming. He signed up for five years, but deserted after just two weeks of the strict lifestyle. He was captured and sentenced to two years hard labor. His marksmanship skills were noticed and he was assigned to a hunting party after just four months. But he deserted again in 1872 and made his way back down to Texas in 1873. He killed another freed slave in Bastrop and was actually arrested for a huge reward on his head. It's not 100% clear, but it is thought that someone bribed the sheriff and Longley was released. In 1875, Longley actually killed his childhood friend, Wilson Anderson, with a shotgun. Longley's uncle allegedly instigated the killing for the revenge of his own son. Longley fled and ended up killing a hunting buddy of his named George Thomas after a fistfight. By 1876, Wild Bill had killed another outlaw named Loud Schroyer. Even more attention had been placed on Wild Bill, and he fled to East Texas where he became a sharecropper for a preacher. His violent past would not elude him. The preacher's nephew had shown affection for a young woman that Wild Bill had his eyes on. Longley beat up the preacher's nephew and was arrested and jailed. Wild Bill Longley escaped jail and rode straight to the preacher's farm and found the preacher milking a cow. 
he walked up and shot the preacher dead with a shotgun. This is documented as the last man killed by Wild Bill Longley. Wild Bill fled to Louisiana, but the law finally caught up with him. He was captured in DeSoto Parish, Louisiana to stand trial for the death of his childhood friend, Will Anderson. He was found guilty and sentenced to death by hanging. Wild Bill wrote letters asking for leniency, even using our old friend John Wesley Harden's sentence of 25 years in prison as proof that his sentence was too harsh. On October 11th of 1878, the 27-year-old Wild Bill Longley stepped onto the gallows, even making a joke about the boards that needed to be repaired. 4,000 people showed up in Giddings, Texas to watch Wild Bill. His last words were, quote, I deserve this. It is a debt I have owed for a wild and reckless life. So long, everybody. To everyone's surprise, the hangman cut the rope too long and Wild Bill Longley's feet could barely touch the ground. The guards and the sheriff had to run underneath the gallows to hold Longley's feet off the ground so he could be hanged. It is said that it took Wild Bill Longley 11 and a half minutes to be pronounced dead. He's buried in the Giddings Cemetery in Giddings, Texas. Thanks for watching Chronicles of Time. I hope you've enjoyed our latest episode and our new and improved audio. We'll see you on the next one. Cheers, y'all.